commodification of nature in forests through red that we've talked about. Promotion of change in consumption patterns of developed countries. The end of intellectual property rights which prevent um, the technologies we're going to need to bring solar and wind and other you know, tidal to the south, but those are under monopoly intellectual property rights. Those have to be ended. Payment of 6% of developing countries' GDP for climate change. And these principles, with a few exceptions and a lot of debate, has been, uh, these have been endorsed by the global climate justice movement. And there's resistance in the UN. The UN ambassador from Bolivia is extraordinary. A man called Pablo Salam keeps trying to bracket the text in this kind of language and doesn't work very much. So maybe Durban should host a new protocol to come up, even if it's only one country. And in the process, hopefully, the kinds of arguments I've been making that seem to me to logically link the green and the red will allow us not to have the kind of problems that, frankly, we did experience in a unifying civil society in, um, in Durban, uh, sorry, in Johannesburg in 2002. Um, saving the environment, uplifting the poor, being divorced, and business getting on uh, with what they wanted. Now, I have a very final, if it's okay, just two, two more slides, really. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, because this seems quixotic, right? This seems so difficult for a few climate justice activists, a few courageous, heroic leaders, Evo Morales and Pablo Salon, some of your own Canadians, you know, Avi Lewis, Naomi Klein, have put out some of the best material. And I mentioned Tony and the, his team and, and, and Maud. But this is a tough battle, right? Is there any example, and if we're talking lessons from Africa and indeed South Africa, I think this should give us some lessons about how to do something remarkable. I don't think since 1994 there's been a single campaign or movement that can claim to have saved millions of lives in the way that um, the treatment action campaign got access to uh, antiretroviral medicines to fight AIDS. In a period like, if I said this to you 10 years ago in this room, you'd have said, no way. Those medicines cost $10,000 a year. The big pharma corps have it locked up. The World Trade Organization is going to absolutely stop you from making generic versions. You're not going to get these medicines out to people that's not enough money. And those people are not considered worth it for the world of these. And here's one of them, Gugu Blamidi from Durban, who went out to do AIDS education in Umlazi, one of the big townships, and was stoned to death because stigmatization was so serious that uh, Gugu Blamidi was seen as a witch. And so the whole psychological sensibility in which AIDS couldn't be talking, you know, Mandela himself said, Wait, we don't talk about that. So this was an exceptional victory to go from ten to $15,000 annual costs to have a Medicines Act under Mandela <coughs> beat up by the State Department in the US and Al Gore, Al Gore, right, the great planet, Al Gore, he said, I want a full court press, this is in the State Department um, rhetoric that they even presented to Congress, against Mandela and the Medicines Act. Because um, basically they didn't want their US companies to have their, their pharmaceutical patents taken away and you know, generalized. So a treatment action campaign formed. Gugu Blamini died as one of the great herons of that struggle. Al Gore ran for president in the middle of 99. He was campaigning not far from here in New Hampshire, the place they usually make their first sort of primary. And suddenly, the allies from New Hampshire, from New York, Philadelphia, they started coming up there with signs that they put behind Al Gore's head. I wish I had one to show you, but it said, Al Gore's greed kills African babies. And he kept seeing these activists whenever he went in mid-99. July, and he went to August, he went to Nashville, he saw them in Nashville, Tennessee, and he saw them all over. And by early September, though he was getting a lot of money, $2.3 million according to the Federal Election Commission from Big Pharma, a lot of money for his campaign, the damage done to him by these signs everywhere he went, by these activists, weighted above that at some point in September, 99, and he said, Uncle, and he said, okay, I will not do a full court press. You can do your you can do your generic drugs. And then Clinton did the same at the WTO protests. He needed credibility. But AIDS dissidents emerged, and in 2000, again in Durban, the big AIDS conference included President Becky saying, um, no, HIV AIDS, no connection. AIDS medicine's toxic. CIA plot, big pharma plot. So there was a big problem, big struggle against both um, Becky and the health minister, Manta Chabalov and Saman. Some of it took place in Toronto, a big famous 
uh, AIDS conference in 2004, but the pharmaceutical manufacturers jumped into the fray and they filed a lawsuit against, it was called PMSA versus Mandela. Yeah, dumb. And the Wall Street Journal said, you guys are really dumb, you know, sue Mother Teresa next year, you know, it's just crazy. <laughs> but they went ahead, but then there was protests from Medicines Sans Frontier, and the Treatment Action Campaign began importing these medicines illegally into South Africa from Thailand and Brazil and India, and actually then the pharmaceutical manufacturers withdrew the lawsuit. And then a constitutional court agreement in 2001 said, Navirapine, uh, which prevents transmissions from mother to children, that has to be given. Come on, Becky, give that medicine. And so that was a big breakthrough. And then in 2002, those critiques got stronger and stronger. And in 2003, the ANC agreed internally, oh, this has gone too far, we've got to change. And by 2004, they started producing generics. By 2010, about 800,000 people were getting um, AIDS medicines that used to cost $10,000 per person per year, now they're getting it free. There are threats, fiscal conservatism, Barack Obama's uh, flatlining and even cutting the, the presidential program, PEPFAR. But the conclusion of this little rah-rah about how you can take on global capital, and you can take on big governments that don't seem to care, and you can take on that whole idea, which is so profound in capitalism, of intellectual property rights, and you can win, gives me five lessons. Commoning, right, is, is, the, is the sort of strategic uh, orientation of, of, a, of a politics that's aware of these huge income inequalities and the need to, to start sharing our, our resources. Decommodifying, making those, those medicines, making water, making at least a, a little bit of electricity for ordinary people free. Destratifying, so that it's not, uh, as in so many things in life, your class uh, or other attributes that give you access, but you're, you're part of a, of a human family. And a deglobalization of capital so that we don't really have to buy these medicines we've learned from New Jersey or Switzerland. We can actually make them in, in mid Rand, South Africa, or Kampala, Uganda, or Harare, Zimbabwe. So deglobalizing capital to make locally and globalizing uh, solidarity. To me, that's the route to a lot of good politics, partly ending apartheid, Canadian role in sanctions, and all very important, and the same sort of globalization of people and deglobalization of capital. And that's, I think, the way to deal with climate apartheid, energy apartheid, global apartheid more generally, as Apiro shows us. It seems like South Africa is going to be a site, like it's been on occasion, where a lot of contradictions come together. And in a site where we probably, after China, have the most protests per person in the world at the moment, running about 10,000 a year, according to police reports. If those of you can come, we'll be so welcome. Except if you represent the Canadian government, or the US government, or the World Bank, <laughs> then you may get an anti-visa uh, for the activists. But the civil society crowd, I hope, will show a lot more of the unity that was needed to defeat apartheid. Certainly, that's going to be needed to defeat climate apartheid. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Patrick, for, for, for questions. Great. Is your tradition two or three at a time, if they're yeah. sort of related? Mm -hmm. So say your name and ID. Maybe you can even shut that friends. So maybe we'll start things off a bit with can you talk a bit about the climate justice movement, what what it entails, particularly in the African continent? Is it a few activists here and there? Are they well established NGOs? Academics, blah, blah, blah. Turn that back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got that slide. Sorry, I just turned off the power here. Okay, let's see if we can get it up. The reason is that we are having such an amazing debate about semantics. So I'd like to <laughs> alert you to who's using, as you say, climate justice and for what uh, reasons. Because it's very, very instructive. And, uh, I'll very take a couple minutes. I'll, I'll mention by way of warming up um, that at the Libyan School of Econ I mean, the London School of Economics. I just want to mention this. Some of you know there's a little purchase of a, a university degree, a PhD, on um, global civil society in the WTO by one. I'll say, forget to get off you. But um, at the LSE, there was a speech last week that attempted to define climate justice as expanding the world carbon market. And I just sent that speech around to a few of the Canadians who, who do this watchdog. 
those of you who didn't get it, you should know about it. I'll tell you who did it in just a moment. But the, the tradition of CJ, I think, can be traced to anti-racist work um, in the South and the US as part of the emergence of environmental justice more generally. And the sort of sense, as they were already thinking about the toxics in their neighborhood, that it wasn't about NIMBY, not my backyard. It's about whether we should be producing toxins. And greenhouse gases were beginning to become aware. I mean, we, we know about greenhouse gases for about a century, that they're going to warm up. But we didn't take it all that seriously until you know, James Hansen, the great scientist from NASA, had some famous testimony in 1988. So I began to pick up from, particularly if you're academics here, Robert Bullard's work um, in Atlanta. Then I think there was a bit of ad hoc activism in the 90s through um, the Kyoto Protocol, but I would point out particularly Axion Ecologica beginning to theorize out of Ecuador with some of the uh, women there who are exceptional, uh, Ivan Yanez, Esperanza Martinez, and um, Jean Martinez Alie. Some of you who are academics who work on ecological economics may, may know that name, Jean Martinez Alie. And they, they were developing climate debt, ecological debt ideas. Some in the 2000s, turned these into technicist questions of who owes what. Some of them were inspired by, do you know the name John Rawls, old Harvard liberal who thought about equity and sharing, about you know, who's produced more GHGs and who should pay the cost, and how can you contract on the GHGs and converge so that you know, China can also industrialize. So there's some technicist work. It's now taking the form of a greenhouse development right advocacy, and some major agencies and church groups have gotten behind that, but I find that a little abstracted from the real political economy of struggle. A Durban group for climate justice emerged actually, um, ironically, just as we were getting in our Center for Civil Society, uh, our program up and running, and it was because of Sajida Khan that all these people came to Durban and said, what is this CDM, what is this carbon trading? We've got to start opposing that. That's been the most coherent network of technical and grassroots people mostly concerned with whether you can solve a problem of the market, the biggest one, climate crisis, through market solutions, and the answer being no. Global justice and radical environmentalists came together finally in a coherent way, I think, in um, Bali in 2007 with the COP there. And uh, that was sort of the global justice movement uh, really beginning to take on environment. And the name of that, Climate Justice Now, persists. And there is a, an email network and a regular gathering and a sort of sensibility of representing CJN, especially in the COPs, um, in contrast to the mainstream environmental network called uh, Climate Action Network. And so they kind of share the space in the COP uh, um, meeting rooms now. Climate Justice Alliance was the European version in Copenhagen in this big Kochebamba conference. Third World Network um, has emphasized climate justice as the power of southern states. And um, Jomo KS is a brilliant UN Department of, for Economic and Social Affairs uh, leader at the United Nations, arguing that CJ would really be best understood as the right of the South to industrialize. This is where you know, it gets a little messy and tricky to work out these semantics. And who wrote, who said, uh, the Libyan, I mean, London School of Economics, that CJ means expanding global carbon markets and regional carbon? It was Mary Robinson. Now she's known in Durban because 10,000 people myself, a few others, one or two up here, were out protesting that the UN World Conference Against Racism, September 2001, did not put Israeli apartheid or um, uh, the uh, reparations due for uh, slavery, colonialism, and apartheid on the agenda. So that was really important to figure out if Mary Robinson could carry this forward. And I hate to say, I don't have the confidence that she's got what, it, you know, what we're talking about in the same way about CJ. It's more about elite re-engagement. That gives you a little sense of the terrain. And I think if I point out a few of the Africans already who made their inputs, none would stand taller than Nemo Basi, a very tall Nigerian. You'll get to know Nemo from, she's a chair of Friends of the Earth, the head of the Earth, uh, the, the group there called Environmental Rights Action. And uh, as I said, just won the Right Livelihood Award. And there's a wonderful network of Friends of the Earth chapters that he's uh, developed. And we had this big meeting in, uh, the World Social Forum last month in Dakar, Senegal, that really brought all of that, especially the West African uh, groups together with very strong South Africans. Kenyans are amazing. There's a very strong network. And I think the best representation of it is a Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, PACSHA. And some of you watching Copenhagen might remember they demonstrated on the floor of the uh, Bella Center, the big convention center, and they said, one Africa, one degree. 
and they were really saying you've got to bring 